everyone and welcome. You will have a couple of instructions on the screen and we're waiting for Vice President Castaldo to join us. All right, I think we, we can start. Uh, Vice President Castaldo will join us in, in the course of the event. Uh, warm welcome to this EPRS online event on the United Nations. We held four online book talks during the lockdown in spring, but this is the first policy roundtable since the beginning of the coronavirus crisis. And we are very proud to be able to organize it with all of you. And we are very honored to have a distinguished panel to discuss our topic, uh, including Vice President Castaldo and including Mrs. Rodriguez Ramos, Parliament's rapporteur, on UNGA. Hello, Mrs. Rodriguez Ramos. You are with us, I think. Hello. So this year we celebrate 75 years since the establishment of the United Nations Organization. Representatives of the 50 countries participating in the funding conference signed the UN Charter on the 26th of June 1945. And the United Nations officially came into existence on the 24th of October the same year, when the Charter was ratified. During this event, we will explore the importance of the UN, the current challenges to multilateralism and the EU's role in the UN and its related bodies. We have one and a half hours in total for the event. The panelists will speak first, and then we will have time permitting a question and answer session. But you are welcome also to use the chat function and we will try to bring in, if possible, your reaction in a real time. So uh, I would like to introduce first Mrs. Uh, Rodriguez Ramos. You have been a member of parliament since 1999. And you came back again last year in the European Parliament. You chair the delegation to the Pan-African Parliament. You are a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. You are a member of the Committee on Environment and also on the Women's Rights and Equality. I think it's all very much linked to the MDGs. You have been also in your own country, Secretary of State, uh, of State for Development for uh, several years. And I would like to ask you to say in a few words uh, what uh, your report outlined and what are the main issues related to the current challenges facing the UN and the EU cooperation? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you for for this uh, introduction. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to participate today at this event. At, at a time uh, when global dynamics uh, are showing us once again the importance of defending multilateralism. Uh, this year uh, we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of the United Nations in a fast-paced international scenario. In a world suffering the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen interlocking uh, dynamics that work between nationalism and a necessary concerted response. It is a good time to bring uh, the debate of multilateralism to the table because the COVID-19 has shown us that in face of global challenges and unilateral response is simply not possible. Health, 
therefore means self of all. At an individual uh, personal level, the pandemic has been something of a turning point, a blow that has made us stop and focus on what is important, health and the importance of caring for those around us. In Spain, in Europe, throughout the world, we have observed an unprecedented battle against a terrible virus that has taken the lives of many citizens. Our societies had faced terrible losses, but how many more could there have been? How many more could there be in the future without concerted action, without global governance, without international solidarity. The battle against COVID-19 is a reality that teaches us two essential lessons. First, multilateralism is an end in itself. And second, multilateralism must be a tool to deliver tangible results in improving lives uh, of uh, citizens. Uh, the pandemic and um, its asymmetrical effects have, uh, have shown the fragility of an interdependent world. It is uh, therefore time to review the weaknesses and to move, to move on to revitalize multilateralism system with the United Nations and at its core. However, to talk about the future, we need to look to the past. The United Nations, like the European Union, has its origins in a world devastated by war and by hatred. They were born from the ashes of a world that understood that the confrontation and hostility was simply not a way forward. Uh, it, was to, it was not a path for the well-being of a nation. It was not a good path for the economies. Uh, it, was, uh, it was not a good way to face the challenges that would allow nation and citizens to progress. I can you hear me? Uh, or is a problem? No, no, no. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, I, uh, the lessons are still relevant when uh, we are dealing with the rise of nationalism and populism in the world. As public officials, as parliamentarians, we cannot allow amnesia to take all in our societies. This is a great challenge to which we will have to respond as citizens and as politicians. Nevertheless, to be honest, these forces of nationalism have always been present to a greater or lesser extent. We must respond by talk, talking with an even stronger voice among ourselves, by finding common paths and common solutions to great global challenges. In 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights marked a milestone in history when 48 states in a world devastated by war and fierce competition, signed a document recognizing themselves as a human family. This document it, uh, is still relevant more than 70 years later. It is still important every day to recognize and defend the rights described in it as a roadmap 
for action. However, it is also clear that the world today does not correspond to that of 70 years ago. The problems of today's citizens are not identical. New challenges are added to important and unsolved problems of the past. For instance, climate change was not considered as a major concern in the past. However, the Eurobarometer shows how, how 20% of EU citizens consider climate change as the second most serious problem at a global level. The right to a healthy environment is also a human right. However, the Paris Agreement is the first international treaty to explicitly recognize just its preamble, the link between climate action and human rights. Climate change is the defining in our time, the, the defining crisis in our time. COVID-19 has spread around the world. There has been increasing emphasis on how humankind interferes with nature and how this interaction creates condition for the spread of new zoonotic diseases. Science shows us how biodiversity loss and ecosystem change can increase the risk of disease spread among humans, animals, and other species. Protecting biodiversity is our best vaccine for the future. Never, nevertheless, the most serious problem facing the world, according to EU citizens, is poverty, hunger, a lack of drinking water, 70% of EU citizens. Unfortunately, 821 million people wake up hungry every morning all over the world. Hunger is an invisible pandemic, which is even growing because of COVID-19. Hunger is not a problem of food production but a problem of respect and protection of human rights. And the most important thing is that hunger at global level is avoidable. But moreover, perhaps the most avoidable human rights violation of our time are the gender inequality, violence and discrimination against women and girls. The challenges I, hi, I have highlighted today are different, but they have one thing in common. They cannot be solved without multilateralism. Many health, economy, and social priorities will emerge in the upcoming months, but we must be able to make our societies and governments understand that multilateralism is a priority that cannot be postponed. The Council conclusion from last July included a very strong statement. Now is the time for international solidarity and cooperation. I totally agree. To paraphrase the Spanish poet Gabriel Celaya, I believe that now more than ever, multilateralism is our best weapon loaded with future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Uh, Rodriguez Ramos, for your presentation and for sharing with us uh, in advance uh, the main points and the philosophy of your reports. Thank you very much for that. We have been joined by 
the vice president of the European Parliament, Mr. Castaldo. Uh, Mr. Castaldo has been member of the European Parliament since uh, 2014, uh, Movimento Cinque Stelle in Italy. He's currently vice president of the European Parliament responsible for human rights and democracy and replaces the president of, uh, of the parliament for discussions with multilateral bodies, including the United Nations and including the WTO. He is member of the Parliament's Committee on Foreign Affairs, the Committee on Constitutional Affairs, and the Subcommittee on Security and Defence. Uh, Fabio, your career in the European Parliament started at the same time as uh, the EPRS was created, and you have often been uh, attending to our events. So we are very pleased to have you with us today. Wait a couple of seconds until Mr. Castaldo come back, comes back to the room. This connection seems to be frozen. I see a little sign. We'll give him a couple of seconds. I see uh, he's unmuted. Mr. Castaldo, can you hear us? As we say in French, in television, les aléas du direct. Mr. Castaldo, can you hear us? Hello? I see you are unmuted. Yes. We hear you. No, I think I think we lost the connection. Let's proceed. Uh, let's proceed uh, with the next speaker. Uh, it's maybe easier to have a connection with New York than to have a connection with another building in Brussels. Um, and one of uh, our speakers is uh, Alexandre Stutman. Welcome to you, uh, Alex. It's nice to see you again. You are director of the European Parliament, but you are currently working at the UN as a special advisor to the president of the UN General Assembly, especially on the UN 27 strategy and implementation. So I'd like to ask you to say some words on the UN 75 campaign. That's an initiative to consult the public on how we can recover better from the pandemic and realize a better world by 2045. Uh, by then, the UN will be uh, 100. And to say also a few words about the current uh, General Assembly Summit on 21st of September, which uh, uh, will look into the outcome of this consultation. So please, Alex, up to you. And we hope that in the meanwhile, Pre uh, Vice President Castaldo will join us back. Excellent. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Etienne. Thank you very much uh, for this. And uh, this is a great initiative which uh, brings New York and uh, Brussels closer together. I mean, we, we really need this. And I guess your, your lapsus was pretty revelateur. As you said, the uh, UN 27, there is indeed a lot of connections and similarities between the UN 75 and the EU 27. And I'll get into this because, I mean, in a way or another, those two organizations share the same DNA and uh, and that is even more patent uh, today but um, anyway friends it's good to to be with you I think we are we are friends of multilateralism here which doesn't mean that we can't criticize what is wrong in multilateralism or what isn't perfect in multilateralism that's probably the only way out anyway 
and uh, we're all friends of the UN or what the UN should be. I mean, the motto of the UN 75 is the future we want, the UN we need. And uh, th that adequation is exactly uh, the quagmire we have to, to get out of. So good morning to everyone. It's 7, uh, 7.50 in New York. Um, the city around me is extremely quiet. I'm talking to you from home because that's the place where there is coffee. The UN these days is uh, on the very low key. As, uh, as Etienne said, I mean, this is meant to be the uh, peak week of the, of the year at the UN. Usually New York is uh, buzzing on a week like this. It's high level week. The world is in New York. And this is what would have happened if there hadn't been a pandemic. Um, it was meant to be a celebration. Uh, we are trying to make it a celebration here. Uh, because uh, what has been achieved in 75 years is there and what needs to be achieved uh, and uh, Mrs. Rodriguez Ramos has uh, spoken about those challenges are out there and they are in dire need of an answer. Um, the pandemic changed the game and as all birthday kids between March and June, uh, the UN has to celebrate its birthday in a low key way this year, which doesn't mean that there is nothing to do and that nothing has been done. Uh, America has been severely hit by the pandemic, like other parts of the world, but New York has gone through a very big trauma during the spring. The city was basically on hold, and therefore there's been uh, very strict quarantine rules uh, involved, which uh, discouraged everyone to travel to New York uh, this, uh, this week. So the high-level week goes on in a virtual way uh, on the basis of pre-recorded statements. It's a bit difficult to imagine, but people are in the GA hall. It's uh, the uh, ambassadors of the 193 plus three uh, countries and permanent observers that are sitting on their national seat and they are introducing the pre-recorded statements of their leaders. So the week got kicked off uh, with a special event on Monday, which was the celebration of the 75th anniversary and the adoption of the political declaration for the 75 years of the UN. And I'll get back to this in a second. Uh, as of yesterday morning, the general debate, as always, uh, is going on and will go on until next Tuesday, where uh, heads of states and governments uh, will deliver their usual annual statement, which is supposed to give their vision and guide the works of the General Assembly for the year ahead. And we did have those uh, pre-recorded statements uh, as of yesterday, and they will continue uh, as I said, for another week. And then it will be followed by three thematic uh, events, summits, uh, one on biodiversity uh, next Wednesday, uh, next week, one on Beijing plus 25, and that is a gender equality women issue summit, which will take place on Thursday, and then the annual event on uh, the elimination of nuclear weapons, which will close that second high level week. Everything in normal times would have taken place at the same time. People would interact, civil society would be present in the premises of the UN, journalists, people would report about it. This is, of course, very different conditions this year. But nevertheless, it's uh, going on and the GA has not stopped working throughout the pandemic. I mean, we have adopted more than 60 resolutions and decisions from March to September. Uh, everything had to be shifted over virtual, which was extremely difficult at the beginning. Delegates were not used to that. Um, a little bit like the European Parliament, the deals are done in person. That's when you talk about how you see things. I mean, diplomacy, just like politics, is about meeting, about discussing, about engaging, about arguing, about convincing each other. And as the uh, President of the General Assembly stated yesterday, uh, welcoming everybody in the GA Hall. Uh, a lot has been accomplished here in terms of overcoming uh, dissensions, but of course this time it had to be virtual. So without this iterative game and socialization of diplomacy, diplomacy had to find a, a different way uh, of moving ahead. Um, 
in the light of the pandemic, of course, this whole high level week takes a very specific uh, significance. We've alluded to this. I mean, Madame Rodriguez Ramos has been alluding to this before. The challenges, the challenges that are perceived by everyone to be those key challenges. And I'll get to this in a second. But I would like to, to quote uh, President Macron yesterday in his opening, uh, in his statement on, uh, for the general debate. Uh, and I'll quote in French. Toutes les fractures qui préexistaient à la pandémie, le choc hégémonique des puissances, la remise en cause du multilatéralisme ou son instrumentalisation, le piétinement du droit international, n'ont fait que s'accélérer et s'approfondir à la faveur de la déstabilisation globale créée par la pandémie. So basically, nothing new. All the challenges that were there last year, where leaders were calling for action, or most of them at least, I remember, um, this is the same message. But the message has been doubled now with an even greater sense of urgency. And I would almost say uh, a need of survival for the organization, but also for the multilateral global world as such. However, there's an optimistic note, and I would like to quote a second uh, quote of uh, President Macron just after the one I've just made, where he says, L'Union Européenne, dont beaucoup en quelque sorte prédisaient la division et l'impuissance, a fait à la faveur de la crise un pas historique d'unité, de souveraineté, de solidarité, de choix de l'avenir. So basically, an optimism there, where uh, the EU, in a way, could also be a model for uh, the UN, with whom it shares, as I said before, the same DNA, in order to figure out a way forward. A way forward guided by political will, obviously, but not only. Because what happened, and we saw this during the pandemic, the Security Council was paralyzed for months, it took ages to the Security Council to come to an agreement upon the proposal of the Secretary General to reach a humanitarian ceasefire, which everybody could agree to. But given the rivalry between uh, some of the big powers in the Security Council, the whole system was basically uh, doomed to failure and to deadlock. And as was said yesterday in the General Assembly, uh, in the statements, the rivalry between the US and China can't be the reason and a sufficient explanation for the rest of the world not to move on uh, and to justify that we it is so hard to agree on so little. So basically, more than ever, this is the time for a wake-up call, for an electroshock, as was mentioned as well yesterday, for a common responsibility to act now uh, because of the urgency, but also because the UN is expected to do that. There is an issue of legitimacy here to act for a strong and effective UN, a UN that doesn't forget about the three pillars that compose its uh, DNA, which are three intertwined pillars of peace and security, development, now called sustainable development, and human rights. Those three dimensions cannot move one without the other. And if you look at the conclusions of the European Council of July of, last, uh, of this year, um, they reflect and mirror exactly those preoccupations, which are the ones of the UN, and which are very clearly reflected in the political declaration that was adopted on, uh, on Monday this week. Uh, it's the promotion of peace and security, it's advancing human rights and gender equality, it's promoting fair globalization with the, with the notion more and more repeated and taken up by the Secretary General of a new social contract that is needed, both domestically and globally. And of course, as was stated before, a sustainable and climate neutral future. Don't forget, this was meant to be the start of the decade of action for the sustainable development goals. I see them, we can see them behind Barbara. Uh, they're all there. And uh, this is uh, the roadmap uh, of the UN for the years to come. And I'm sure Barbara will tell us more about this in a second. So the ideas are on the table. We know where, where we are going. Some know where they want to go uh, and are encouraging others to do the same. And as Macron again said, I mean, multilateralism is more than a profession de foi, more than faith. It is action. And it is a clear, the moment for a clear call to action. As I said, the, the UN hasn't stayed idle over the last few months, although this is not always perceived as such. And there's the same difficulty between what the EU does and what the UN does and how it gets to the wider audience. Maybe, maybe the UN would need a parliament sometime that goes back to the constituencies and talks about what the UN is doing. Very often the narrative, 
the norm setting of the UN is a little dis it remains disconnected from what actually gets implemented on the ground. And this is difficult. And resident coordinators, Barbara knows that, are doing a fantastic job in trying to trickle down what is adopted by the General Assembly, by the Security Council there, to, in order to make this a reality on the ground. But there again, sometimes communications is difficult. The UN, just like other organizations, is not always very good at communicating uh, about itself. So, as I said, I mean, it was meant to be a celebration. And it started in January uh, of, uh, of last year, uh, of this year, sorry, as uh, with the launch of the UN 75 campaign. Secretary General had appointed a special advisor, Fabrizio Horschild, under Secretary General with the whole team, uh, in order to look uh, and go out, uh, get, the, get the UN out of headquarters, get the UN out of its UN uh, houses and go to the people, go to citizens, because the charter says we the people, um, and go for the widest ever global consultation with surveys, dialogues, pop-ups. The Secretary General himself did a lot of dialogues. The PGA did dialogues. They started in a real way, and they had to, of course, shift over to virtual. But they happened. And for those who are interested, this is the report, which is online, which was published uh, at the end of last week, uh, just at the eve of the uh, 21st of September, and uh, where the results that, uh, of those surveys and dialogues are uh, contained. So you can have a look at that. It's an extremely uh, interesting uh, read, uh, which goes a little bit away along the conclusions that uh, Mrs. Uh, Rodriguez Ramos has, has, uh, has presented before on where citizens of the world, global citizens perceive um, the needs uh, for action, what they perceive as the greatest challenges and threats, and how to respond to it. And there's been a lot of responses coming from those dialogues, especially from youth, from civil society, from the private sector. The UN's also understanding that maybe it hadn't reached out to non-state actors, and that includes parliaments as well, as much as it could have. Uh, and that's something for the future. That's part of that roadmap for the future. So those inclusive consultations are due to continue uh, because the Secretary General is due to present some recommendations of the basis of the political declaration that has been adopted. Now, if we go to this political declaration, um, there has been, of course, a symbiosis work between this UN 75 campaign of the Secretary General and what the General Assembly has done in terms of consultations to prepare the text that was adopted on Monday. The text adopted, this declaration is available online. It is now a resolution of the General Assembly and is meant as a renewal of the Charter for the next 25 years. Um, the way this works in the General Assembly is that uh, co-facilitators are appointed. It's some sort of a rapporteurship. Uh, in the UN, it's always two co-rapporteurs, two co uh, one from the Global North, one from the Global South. In this case, we managed to have an EU member among the Global North, it was Sweden and Qatar. And those two countries, those two ambassadors in New York carried out consultations with all stakeholders, with the different states in order to uh, reach the text uh, and the agreement. And there were two difficult uh, points in that declaration uh, towards the end of the negotiations, which is a very ambitious declaration, which is actually a miracle that we had a text given the circumstances of rivalry that prevail currently among the membership of the General Assembly and the Security Council. The two uh, tricky points were the Paris Agreement uh, climate and there surprisingly, well, not that surprisingly, but surprisingly historically, the problematic country was the United States of America. Now, this is the country that has been the leading founder of the UN, that is hosting the main headquarters of the UN, that has been one of the main promoter and financer of the UN together with the uh, European Union and the 27 member states. And this is the country that nowadays is making those progress difficult. So that has been an issue. And if you look at the text, there has to be, we had to find a compromise, basically excluding America from the commitments uh, to the uh, Paris Agreement, which anyway, they're in the process of withdrawing from, but they wanted to make that very clear in the text, also for domestic uh, reasons, given the current electoral context in the United States. And the other interesting tricky point was the 
apparently innocent phrase of a shared vision for a common future. Now you would think that these are innocent words. It turns out that this is uh, the uh, English translation of a concept which in uh, China is a specific uh, way of looking at the world, at development, at human rights, etc. And so basically, America and others opposed that phrasing, and there had to be a new phrasing found, which you can also find in the resolution. So the declaration got adopted, and now it needs implementation. As I said, the Secretary General will recommend, uh, will come up in the course of the year with recommendations to advance the common agenda and to respond to current and future challenges. Uh, the General Assembly will have a special session, most likely in November, on uh, the pandemic and the fight against COVID. And basically, th what is clear here in this paradoxical moment, a moment of uh, refounding, as the, uh, a foundational moment, as the Secretary General called it yesterday, is the positive paradox of cooperation and solidarity are lacking more than ever, and they are more needed than ever, which of course is a logical consequence. And what is mattering here, and I think this speaks to parliamentarians and speaks to politicians, and I sometimes wish there were more politics at the UN, is the need for political will. Um, the need to reinforce the multilateral system while, of course, reinforming the institutions rather than bashing the institutions when, at the moment when they are most needed. But that doesn't mean that you can be critical against those institutions, but maybe first get out of the crisis and see then how that could not happen again in the same way. But for the moment, what is, what is sad to say is that the US and China, who are two of the key players, are not ready to agree on any fundamental reform of the United Nations. And as long as this um, dichotomy is not going to change, uh, it will be extremely difficult to transform uh, an organization that sometimes is ill-equipped to an organization that is fit for purpose. But just like the European Union, uh, and even more so because there is no supranational dimension in the UN, uh, the UN cannot be more than what the member states uh, that compose it can give to it. And as Macron said again yesterday, uh, the UN has delivered when member states have given Alex. it the means to deliver. So let's hope that message will be heard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, uh, for being long. But I, I forgive you because I think it's part of the UN uh, system also to make long speeches. Just joking. No, thank you for, for sharing this uh, insider information about the dynamics uh, of, uh, of the UN and what's going on there. So uh, I welcome again uh, Vice President Castaldo for joining us. I know this event's uh, a challenge. It's, uh, it's difficult, but here we are. It works. Uh, it works in New York. It works in Brussels. And we are very, very happy to have uh, you with us. As, as I said before, you are Vice President of the Parliament, responsible for human rights and democracy, and you replace the Vice, the President of the Parliament for multilateral bodies, including the UN and the WTO. In the, in the Parliament, you are a member of AFET, the Committee on Foreign Affairs, uh, also the Committee on Constitutional Affairs, and the Subcommittee on Security and Defense. So we are very uh, pleased to have you with us and uh, let you uh, share uh, your thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monsieur Basso. And uh, let me first of all apologize, but we experienced some problems with the connection today. So what was supposed to be my introductory uh, speech with some uh, uh, preparatory remarks, of course, and now has been postponed. But uh, let me say, let me start uh, really saying that I'm extremely pleased to take the floor in such an important seminar with such distinguished panelists that we are hearing today, starting from my colleague Maria, uh, Soraya Maria Rodriguez Ramos, who is actually rapporteur from the EU priorities at the 70, uh, 75th UN General Assembly, and going ahead with the director Barbara Pesce Monteiro, uh, director for the UN Development Program here in Brussels. Mr. Sander Stutzman, my dear friend, and also an excellent advisor, actually, of the UN General Assembly, the pres its presidency, but also with a long story inside the Foreign Affairs of the European Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament, as well as Professor Jan Wouters from the Levan Center for Global Governance Studies, and Dr. Yonel Zamfir from the uh, Members Research Service from the EPRS that is hosting us today. 
As you well know, the United Nations were founded in 1945, right after the Second World War, to maintain the international peace and security, develop friendly relations among nations, and promoting social progress, better living standards, and human rights. As we heard today from the panelists that took the floor before me, uh, the over, overarching purpose was to harmonize the actions of the nations to achieve these goals. But this year, the 75th uh, anniversary has a specific meaning, and we have the possibility to, to put our sights on our back. UN members soared from 51 to 193, encompassing practically all recognized and sovereign states in the world, and the organization has also a track record of remarkable accomplishment in every corner of the globe, affecting the, uh, the lives of millions of people through uh, its specialized agencies, funds, and programs, and ultimately making the world a better place. Among the UN milestones, I want to I could remember, of course, just a few. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, it was the first legal, legal document protecting universally the human rights. The Treaty of Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, in its 50th anniversary, it continued to be a cornerstone of the global nuclear non-proliferation regime. The Convention on the Rights of the Child, entering into force in 1990, the most rapidly and widely ratified international human rights treaty in history, the Millennium Summit, Summit of 2000, and the Millennium Development Goals, followed by the Sustainable Development Goals in the framework of the 2030 Agenda. The International Criminal Court, legally and functionally independent from the United Nations and not part of the UN system, whose founding text in the Roman Statute was negotiated within the UN nevertheless, the UN Climate Change Conference, the, we, 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 the first one, the COP1, held in Berlin 1995, and the Intergovernmental Conference on the Global Compact for Migration on 2018, uh, the first ever UN Global Agreement on a Common Approach to International Migration in, in uh, all its dimension. As I said before, in its 75 years, the United Nations it specialized agencies, related agencies, funds, programs, and staff were awarded the prestigious, the prestigious Nobel Peace Prize 11 times. That's still an unchallenged record. Despite these uh, outstanding achievements, it's not time to celebrate, as unfortunately we were listening with the speeches just before me. The world is plagued by growing inequality, poverty, hunger, armed conflicts, terrorism, insecurity, climate change, and pandemics, and, 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 and the least developed countries are falling behind. Not only the situation is worsening, and the world is different from the one env envisaged by the UN founders 75 years ago, but we are also living what is considered one of the worst crises of multilateralism and its organization, including the UN. This surprisingly happens at the time when more international cooperation would be sorely needed to tackle challenge that are more and more global in scope and unprecedented in scale, impossible to face in the states, such as climate change, migration flows, arms control, poverty and inequality, cybersecurity, just to name a few of them. Let me quote what just said not a long time ago, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Multilateralism is under fire precisely when we need it most. The causes behind the crisis of an international rule-based order and the multilateral system being under siege are extremely complex and deep. Today we have had the occasion, the privilege, to listen to most of the ideas from uh, Alexander that is inside the, the in actually the UN General Assembly and is, of course, as a privileged point of view in this regard. And I would like to stress is a, a call uh, for action, let's go back to the people, let's go back to the citizens, as is somehow is stated by in our DNA. And this extremely complex and deep cause, in part the product of a global phenomenon of rising nationalism across the globe, and also the country first politics, as well as the result of unilateral actions taken by the great powers like China, Russia, and also the United States, has to be analyzed. Only by understanding these causes and the shifting that we are weakening, and that are weakening in multilateralism, you can chart their way forward. And I'm sure the speakers here today will continue to shed some light on these aspects as they did with the first two speeches 
you had the honor, the privilege to listen to and to share. Let me just add a very few points, some food for thoughts to animate also the rest of the discussion and the forthcoming intervention. First reflection I would like to share with you. While the multilateral system may be in crisis, reports of its death appear to be greatly exaggerated. If it's true that the U.S., the de facto quarantine of the, of the international order has pulled out from some UN bodies and has a president that profoundly distrusts international institutions, there are at least two good reasons to harbor some important hope. The first element is the response to this disengagement of the U.S. No date, no other state has followed. To date, no other state has followed the U.S. On the contrary, many parties have reinforced their support political and financial to internationalist mechanisms. And that is especially true for the European Union. And second, we are in an election year. The outcome of US elections will have a deep impact on the future of multilateralism, as a new US president may well eventually reverse Trump's administration's stance on this issue. The second main reflection I would like to share the UN played a pivotal role in shaping the world as we know it today. Undoubtedly, without its action, humanity overall would be a worse place. That, that doesn't mean there haven't been failures or that it has to grow complacent on the opposite. I believe there is a certain inadequacy of existing multilateral rules to meet new challenges, a mismatch between the reality and the structure. That this is particularly true for the composition of the Security Council, whose permanent members reflected the power structure of the world as it was in 1945, and where the sustained use of veto rights has hindered the council action. This parliament, our parliament, our house, through its resolutions, has argued in favor of a comprehensive reform of the UN Security Council to improve its representativeness and better reflect today, today's global order as well as for significant limitations or regulations on the use of veto rights, particularly in cases of war crimes and crimes against humanity. We also ask for the revitalization and greater role of the General Assembly, which is the most representative organ of the United Nations in our common opinion and common sensibility. I agree with both these suggestions. The UN has to modernize to face new realities and challenges and the as Alexander said just previously, we need some political will to go ahead, some clear political will and commitment to go ahead in this direction. The third point concerns the role of the EU, of the EU in strengthening the multilateral system. The EU has long called for a seat in the Security Council, but despite not having obtained it yet, with the, its role of reinforced observer, it makes a difference through quiet diplomacy and mediation which are needed more than ever in a time when the logic of the lowest common denominator dominates the sea. By presenting its own proposal and amendments and contacting like-minded partners, the Union has an important role to play in safeguarding the multilateral way of working. One good example of successful quiet diplomacy is the recent approval on the Human Rights Council of the resolution on Belarus submitted by the European Union. This year, the Parliament will once again prepare its recommendation to the General Assembly on the way forward. As we have the rapporteur here today, and we listen to the priorities, you can imagine and you can really feel that we would like to play a main role in defending the multilateral order. And I also would call for a strengthened dialogue with the other regional integration, integrated organization for, of course, starting from Latin America, taking account also the development in the Asian countries, the GCC, all form and all possible regional integration organizations should be a privileged partner for us in shaping this direction uh, of a new format and a new reform of the multilateral system and uh, a more efficient UN, UN uh, structure. Dear friends, let me quote John Fitzgerald Kennedy to conclude this short reflection that I shared with you. When written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters. One represents danger and the other represents opportunity. 
we are facing what the Secretary General Guterres defined as the biggest challenge the world has faced since the war, Second World War, the COVID-19 pandemic. This crisis reminded us the importance of international united and solidarity and the unless everyone is safe, no one, no one is safe, as we are all in this together. It is a strong warning that we can face challenges separately and fail or do it together and succeed. We have to learn this lesson, size the opportunity to put all our efforts, strengthen and rebuild multilateralism as we are painfully aware that there really aren't other alternatives. So I look forward to listen to the other uh, in contribution and intervention. And thank you once more for this opportunity and this privilege to be together with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice President, for coming to us and, and sharing your thoughts about the challenges we are uh, facing uh, with multilateralism and also the EU engagement for the uh, United Nations system. Uh, it brings me uh, smoothly to the next speaker with Barbara Peche Montero. You are director, Barbara, of the Brussels Office of the United Nations and of the UN Development Programme and the representative of the UN Secretary General in Brussels. You have a very extensive experience working in the field of UNDP in various countries. And I wanted to ask you uh, about the ongoing UN reform and what you think about the EU, uh, EU uh, UN partnership in the various entities of the UN system. But I received also a question in the blog that is asking me about uh, the UN activities in the field of developments and in particular uh, the question of the SDG. And I think these questions uh, fit very well together. So up to you, Barbara. And have her mute the microphone. Now it's good. The wrong person was unmuted. Okay, you can hear me well now? Okay, thank you very much and I, I will touch those issues, but I, I cannot resist uh, a little bit of reference to the GA and, and the conversations that are taking place. L let me quickly do that um, because uh, for us, the UN, the support that the EU provides uh, to multilateralism is really very important at this time. Um, we were very um, happy um, obviously, uh, with the declarations of uh, President Michel, uh, the High Representative Borrell, but also the references uh, by the President of the Commission and her State of the Union interventions. The, the commitment of, the, of Europe to multilateralism and to the underlying values is really very, very important uh, in this moment of crisis. Um, but beyond Europe and with Europe, I think it's really important as, as uh, Alex and actually even uh, the commitment of, of the Parliament of having Alex in New York connected to the General Assembly and making sure that there is this bridge between the European values, the direction of the UN and making sure that we move forward in parallel is fundamental. But, you know, we've started having the first declarations, as, as Alex said, uh, we will have some heads of state without making names who are obviously very critical. But the fact that in this space there is this reiteration of the need of multilateralism is key. Um, there, there have been a lot of expressions on the importance of restoring uh, multilateralism as a driving force for international recovery based on ideal social progress and better standards of living for all in line with what um, MEP Rodriguez was mentioning. Climate change was referred to and sustainable peace and uh, development. The uh, G77 are going along in those lines, but of course, with the recognition that this is necessary. Let me also add a few issue, uh, elements to what uh, Alex was saying on the uh, UN 75 and the anniversary. Um, of course, the, the anniversary had been set even before the, um, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, and uh, what, we, what the uh, Secretary General did at that time was to try and open the space beyond the governments 
on the discussion on the UN, because very the UN is obviously an intergovernmental organization. A lot of the discussions take place as expressed by the presidents. But there was a real need to make sure that there was a dialogue with the population and maybe also to address what, what Alex was saying and this difficulty in, in the communication and, and the dialogue part. Um, and um, the, the um, UN 75 and the report that, that uh, Alex referred to was an attempt to have this dialogue with the world. Uh, the we the people that the UN really represents to discuss about the future we we want and the UN that we need and to sort of get into that conversation of uh, on what are the global uh, challenges what are the gaps between the future that we want and the direction that we're going towards and just to give you an idea of how this took place. There were about a thousand dialogues that uh, took place. We were supposed to have one with the parliament. We had uh, with Vice President Castaldo and and, um, and also with um, several of, of your MEPs, we had seen how we could do that dialogue. Unfortunately, uh, th uh, COVID did not allow that, but it did happen in, in, in several countries with parliaments, uh, ballrooms, and all sorts of uh, different spaces. There was a survey a one minute survey that was launched and is still online uh, to which 1 million people responded. And then we have been looking at inter uh, in um, artificial intelligence to look at the analysis of what's coming out in the social media and, and in the conventional media. And there were some results on that, which I think are very important because those are going to feed into the kind of reform. So on the one hand, the reforms that the member states are asking us and that are being discussed in New York right now, but also the needs and the perceptions. And I think it's important to have these because uh, very often when, when we talk about the UN and the criticisms, we I, I don't think we, we pick up all of the complexity of the analysis. These surveys and these dialogues identified that within uh, COVID and very much in line with what uh, MEP Rodriguez was saying, the immediate priority is seen as improved access to ba basic services. So the very important issues healthcare, uh, safe water, sanitation, and education, uh, and the need for greater international solidarity, increased support to those who are most hit. Uh, several of you have touched the issue of inequalities. I think co the COVID crisis really highlighted the issue of inequalities. Um, you know, we, we've heard it in, in Europe as in the rest of the world. Uh, the poorest had less access to, to computers and to education. The women were the ones who were hardest hit because they, they, they were hit both uh, in terms of their jobs, but also in terms of their workload, but also in terms of the violence that was happening at home. So the issue of inequalities between people and between countries has really come out very, very strongly. And I say this because very often when we talk about the UN, we only concentrate on the Security Council. And I think when we talk about the UN and the, the relevance of it, we need to look at that. And, and I think the, the, the issues that you've raised in terms of the reform are very relevant and are part of the conversation, what is coming out. But it is also very much about the work that we do and that we are asked to do uh, and where we have an impact on the ground. And that, and I will touch to this and what you were asking me about the SDGs and all of that within now the COVID. So very much what people are really caring about is not just the big conflicts and all of that, which are very important and, and are up there, but very much about basic services and, and the things that, that touch people's lives. And, and, and we do want to, as we engage in the future, touch into those. Uh, but looking at the future, the surveys, and this again refers to what you were saying Soraya, is the issue of the climate crisis and the destruction of, of the natural environment. People are looking at that as one of their, their, their big preoccupation. And this is in Europe and outside Europe. And it is very much part of the future that they want and, and, and the way the UN is, but will also uh, more and more have to uh, look at it. And then in terms of the perception on the UN, over 87% of the respondents um, said that global cooperation is vital. So we're having governments in the General Assembly identify that, but population also saying that very, very strongly. And by the way, uh, there, there was a, a, a lot of effort and outreach to young people because the UN has to be relevant to the young people if, if, if we're talking about uh, the future. 
70% identified the UN as essential, but, and that is what I think is really important, uh, a UN that has to change and innovate, and a UN that has to be more innovative, transparent, accountable, and effective. And that, of course, picks up some of the concerns that Vice President Castaldo was also uh, referring to. Now, we, the UN, are going to be, have to listen to this. Some of it we're, we're we, we are already tackling uh, it, and I think we will need to be better at sharing information on. For example, the issue of transparency. You should know that uh, there is an independent aid transparency index that has existed uh, for many years now. In the last years, for example, UNDP has been between the first and the third most transparent in the world. Right now it's in the third position. UNICEF is in the sixth position. And by the way, uh, I, I invite all of you to go and look where the EU institutions are, where the development agencies of member states are, because you will you 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 will have some surprises. So um, again, perceptions and reality, the need to improve, but also the the need to understand where we are. Alex referred to the UN reform. The Secretary General is very committed to it, and the whole of the system is moving forward in that direction and um, also delivering on it. Now, where are we in terms of uh, the very important issues? Let's look at the role that the UN did, had on the response to the COVID. Um, there has been a report that just came out a few days ago. Um, there's an updated report on the UN comprehensive response on, on COVID. I invite you to go and read it. Uh, if needed, I'm very happy to share the link. I think it will do, give some very important uh, information that is perhaps not uh, sufficiently well known. The UN on the ground has helped to prepare, respond, and respond to the health crisis. For example, it has supported the developing countries uh, to preposition PPEs. Uh, as you know, there, because Europe faced it too, there was a, a very fierce competition on, on, on the global market to make sure that these equipment was, uh, was available. It was largely going to some of the bigger uh, economies. Well, the UN uh, supported in procuring 452 million items of PPE and prepositioning it in countries of the global south. Uh, in addition to, uh, for example, supporting these countries to prepare their civil protection, their coordination bodies, and make sure that as it reached, because we, we were fortunate enough to have some months of, of pre-warning, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised that some of the lower numbers of the health impact of the crisis uh, is also due to the support that these countries uh, received. I will refer to it afterwards. Some of it was done with the EU, with EU funding, um, some with new funding that was received and others with, with funding that we had that we were able to reconvert and rapidly be able to direct it to this crisis. On the humanitarian and the socioeconomic crisis, for example, so on the one hand, we helped to prepare uh, and, and put them in conditions to, to respond. On the other, as, as the crisis hit the countries, we helped with the uh, humanitarian and the uh, socioeconomic uh, crisis. Again, let me give you some numbers of what the UN did. Uh, 227 million children were assisted with distance and home-based learning uh, through UNICEF. Uh, 36 million households benefited from additional social assistance provided by governments from the support of UN families. Uh, 46 million refugees, IDPs and migrants received assistance to try and avoid that the impact of it uh, 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 hit them in a moment of crisis. And now WFP and the UN are, uh, start, are preparing to face uh, a, a, a terrible crisis of extreme hunger that we uh, we, we we see looming uh, very quickly. So we helped pre to to prepare. We helped the humanitarian uh, crisis, but we're also looking at the same time to help the countries recover better. Through the lead of the UNDP offices, we have looked. We have formulated socioeconomic impact assessments in 88 countries. So as the crisis was unfolding, we worked with the governments to, to do that. Uh, we have helped formulate an uh, economic response plan in 92 countries. So we are helping the government see where is it that the crisis is hitting most? Where is it that they have to direct their own funds? Where funds do they need to get from where? 
and under the leadership, including of the Secretary General, we are getting involved in all the, 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 the conversation that has to take uh, globally together with the banks on uh, the fiscal space, the debt, um, because of course these countries, as they are just like Europe, as they are addressing the crisis, are are, are funding their 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 uh, their cash are are uh, depleted, and of course you will have seen the reports by ILO uh, on the impact on employment, uh, the loss of jobs, and the uh, and and what this will mean. You'll have seen that in many of these issues, I don't all need to talk about the global south because the UN has been accompanying the process in the global north and in the global south. Of course in very different ways. And in the global south, the impact, of course, is, 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 uh, is more complex to address given the financial situation of these countries. And this, and, and, and um, that, of course, leads me a little bit to the conversation on the SDGs. Um, you know, we, we had a battle in the past uh, because as we pass from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals, we we um, which are a wider, more complex set that reflects maybe uh, uh, better the society than 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 in the past, which includes peace and security, and as includes now governance, and has showed how none of these things are uh, separated in silos. So if you look at the health, uh, the the health and the economic and the environment, as we have been saying, are very closely connected. So. To the question that people raise, are SDGs still relevant? Uh, you know, should we remain on this conversation? They are very relevant. They 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 have showed that this is exactly it. The inequalities that is underlying uh, um, the, the 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 whole uh, 2030 agenda have, is exactly what has been proved to be lacking in Europe and elsewhere. Had we been able to tackle the SDGs better in the past, we probably wouldn't have had the same kind of impact of the pandemic than we did. If we had been able to have health systems that were prepared, if we had tackled with, with the environmental issues and linking them up with all the rest, and perhaps the impact would not have been as dramatic as it is proving. And I think the goals also showed once again that they are relevant to Europe and elsewhere. Of course, they have different characteristics, but it's, it is underlying. And I am very appreciative of the fact that the president of the commission has put the SDGs in the mission letter of every single uh, commissioner. I think it is also very important as we move forward to make sure that as the commission moves forward in its agenda and as the parliament and, and the council also uh, move forward, we do not confuse the uh, Green Deal with the SDGs. The Green Deal is a very important element of the SDGs, but it is not the totality of it. And if we just look at the environmental and, clim and climatic aspect, which is fundamental and, and is something that the UN counts on immensely in the dialogue moving forward, if we're not able to sort of see all of the agenda and, and see how it is relevant and make sure that it is part of the SDG semester, but also on the work that the different commissioners are doing, we will not have taken this 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 uh, pandemic as an opportunity of a change of paradigm, and I think this is what uh, this 2020 for me will represent. It could just represent a year of disaster, or it can represent a year of opportunity of thinking of the future that we want and what we need to do to tackle it. And from my perspective, the SDGs are very much part of it. Now, how does the, the alliance with the EU come into uh, uh, come on board. First of all, the commitment to multilateralism and the translation of this commitment into implementation and and uh, and impact on the ground. The fact that the EU is leading from the front, for example, on the climate agenda is really very important for the UN. And I think the partnership that we will do will be key. Uh, Alex did not refer to this meeting in particular, but for us, you, the EU and ourselves, it's very important. There will be a uh, head of state meeting on the 29th of September where the presidents uh, will, will, will participate. It's, a, it's part of the high level process of the funding for development. Uh, the EU is one of, of, of the key actors there and it is about building back greener and better. I think that will be a fundamental space where the EU can lead, but where we need to work together as UN and EU of making sure that there is this change of paradigm moving forward. It is not going 
And you'll see that the terminology has changed. It's not building back better. It's not going back to where we were. It is moving forward. It is recovering better. And that has to be part of the, um, of the decade of action. So we, we need to make sure that these next 10 years are about making sure that, that these goals that we had looked at and that we had sometimes just seen as indicators and goals and you know a technological uh, development specialistic thing as real issues that need to be tackled in the countries this requires uh, uh, the the human the 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 inclusiveness the the environmental when the sdgs were put together it was a realization that the social the economic and the environment cannot be tackled separately that all of yeah. it comes together so we're back to that, and I think these next 10 years need to be in, in, uh, in that sense. And of course, the European Green Deal is, is, is an opportunity. So okay. I am uh, worried, but I am optimistic. I think the UN has the role of being optimistic and uh, showing the road forward and being a space where different actors and different countries come together to find solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara, for this uh, presentation. Uh, I come now to uh, Professor Jan Waters. It's uh, it's always uh, unpleasant to come at the end of a, of a panel. Uh, we're sorry for that, but we still have enough time. You are uh, Jean Monnet. Uh, you have the Jean Monnet Chair and you're Professor of International Law at the Catholic University in Leuven. You've published extensively on global governance, as well as on EU external policies, including on the EU's role in the United Nations system, both the organization and the system. So I'd like to ask you what you consider as the main challenges for multilateralism today, and what is the role of the EU? And I just want to say also that I have received a question via the blog that is raising uh, an issue that is very dear to the parliament, is how we can advance on the two fronts of, on the one hand, demo democracy and human rights. I know these are difficult questions uh, when we are in the UN system, uh, but I think it's important also to look at this issue. So if you could, uh, Professor, maybe uh, also uh, say a few words on, on your views on, on this aspect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a great honor to participate in this uh, excellent panel. And of course, I mean, these are very broad issues. And at the age of 75, the United Nations is suffering from various ailments, from bureaucratization to politicization, underfunding, understaffing, overload, mission creep, mutual competition between some of its constituent parts. And I think that indeed um, that's all normal for an organization that reaches a certain age. But the question is, can we really reform ourselves? And I regret to say that the dynamics to really significant reform of the United Nations and its components are currently rather low key, if not uh, nearly inexistent. I know that in the beautiful declaration adopted last Monday, commemorating the 75th anniversary of the UN, there is a commitment to instill, I quote, to instill new life in the discussions on the reform of the Security Council and also of the General Assembly in ECOSOC. Well, I wish you all good luck because, uh, you know, this is, of course, a very, very difficult uh, enterprise. The five permanent members are just there from the Northern Hemisphere, uh, each having a veto right. Uh, the Cold War is 30 years behind us. New tensions are paralyzing the functioning of the Council in, in important areas, and in fact, Alexander was alluding to it. It was quite telling that it took the Security Council so long to basically adopt a resolution uh, uh, responding to the Secretary General's call for a humanitarian ceasefire in the ongoing armed conflict, and even occasioning a, a, a veto by one of the permanent members on the 8th of May. So, I mean, in its current composition, in its current way of functioning, it is clear that the UN Security Council is not going to be able to take on the great challenges of the next 25 years, and especially not of the next 75 uh, years. It, need both, it needs both a stronger legitimacy and a higher efficiency. But everybody is totally divided about the way uh, forward. And as you all know very well, the current permanent members also have a veto right to uh, basically um, uh, vote down any reform of the 
uh, Security Council. So that's highly uh, problematic. Um, of course, the Security Council is one thing, the United Nations Organization is another thing. The whole system or family of United Nations uh, specialized agencies and other uh, bodies is a fascinating thing that is constantly uh, evolving. And I, I really uh, like all the dynamics that are going on there, but we see similar problems there. Also, quite a number of United Nations specialized agencies suffer from the problems I've just described. And uh, I'm sad to say that the WHO in a certain way has become very much in the limelight uh, with the COVID-19 crisis, displaying also some of the weaknesses of the organization uh, when uh, responding to that uh, uh, pandemic. I think that much of the criticism has not been fair, but there are definitely certain weaknesses that need uh, to be addressed. And in a way, these are general issues that are not just limited to one specific agency. One would have to have a bit of the, let's say, overall vision to bring those issues together and to have a frank and open discussion uh, about it. Um, I think also another big problem that has transpired through the other uh, presentations is the current lack of international uh, leadership. I'm not blaming so much the leadership of the United Nations. I think that our Secretary General Gutierrez is doing an excellent job in the most impossible of circumstances. But we, of course, all know that the world has changed and that in the construction of the post-World War II international order, the shaping of global institutions has always been, with maybe some minor exceptions, um, happened under American leadership. It was the Truman and the Roosevelt administrations which took the lead in designing the United Nations, the Bretton Woods institutions, and so on. And uh, we were referring to the great day of 26th of June 1945, uh, when the United Nations Charter was signed in San Francisco, and when a visibly emotional President Harry Truman emphasized that the Charter puts a special responsibility on powerful states to rein in their power and to uh, use the Charter for the benefit of world peace. And he basically said, literally, we all have to recognize, no matter how great our strength, that we must deny ourselves the license to do always as we please. And Truman, in those uh, historical words, also emphasized that the United Nations Charter could only work if the UN member states were determined to use it, and that if they failed to use it, you would basically betray all those who had died in that horrible Second World War um, and uh, that have given their lives to basically uh, create a world of freedom uh, and safety. So, I mean, these were historical uh, words of a U.S. president determined to make the new world organization really work. But compare that to the current attitude of U.S. administrations, and I think we really see a glaring, glaring uh, difference. And the COVID-19 pandemic, in a certain way, um, shows this lack of international leadership. It was Ian Bremmer who has uh, described the current corona crisis as the first global crisis without leadership, the first G0 uh, crisis. And I'm afraid there is truth in that. So who can take over the leadership role of the United States, if you have to ask ourselves that question? It has been mentioned before, but in the United Nations system, it is clear that currently China is quickly filling up that vacuum. It has recently become the second financer of the United Nations and of UN peace operations after the US, but before Japan and all European countries. It already counts four director generals at United Nations agencies, and it is also showcasing and promoting its Belt and Road Initiative under the flag of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Still, I hope I may raise the question whether indeed the Chinese domination of the United Nations would be something that we really would like to pursue also from a European perspective where we care deeply, as you just raised, uh, Mr. Chairman, about the respect and the promotion of human rights and uh, democracy. Which brings me to the European Union in the United Nations system. Yeah, it's great uh, for me as a jurist to read our EU treaties and to see how strong the commitment to multilateralism and to working together with the United Nations is. There is the famous Article 21 of the EU Treaty, which literally says that the EU is committed 
to promote multilateral solutions to common problems, in particular in the framework of the United Nations. I love that quote. I always share it with my students. And then, of course, we have discussions about the question, yeah, how deep is that commitment to multilateralism? Aren't there also cases or um, uh, certain um, uh, issues on which the European Union is a little bit less multilateral than its treaties are actually proclaiming it uh, to be? But then the big question is also, can the European Union, um, in a way, re Juvenate, and it helped to exercise leadership in the United Nations. I think that um, it's it's something important to consider. I think we should really uh, hope for this European determination to exercise reinvigorated uh, leadership within the United Nations, if possible, together with like-minded democracies from other regions. It's very important to have cross regional support, as we know very well within the United Nations, but it's very important to have that support from nations who really share our fundamental values and our commitment to uh, multilateralism. But still, we have to be also honest with ourselves. While coordination between the 27 EU member states takes place for quite a number of UN matters, especially in the General Assembly, this is by me, no means a really generalized practice. Our individual EU member states are still pursuing their national interests within quite a number of United Nations organs, programs, funds, and agencies. They are also admittedly very much attached to their own vested institutional position as member states of the United Nations, which brings its own privileges, its own seats, and so on. And it is also true to say that the United Nations itself also has a role in that because the UN fundamentally remains a club of and for nation states. It's nation states only, and that in a way complicates the role for the European Union as a regional organization within the United Nations. Obviously, if you have read carefully the 75th anniversary declaration, then you will see that indeed there is a commitment of the UN to boost partnerships and make the UN more inclusive and engage all other pertinent stakeholders, including regional organizations. I love that commitment, but I have to say that, I mean, in the very facts, it's still the member states and especially the more powerful member states that really matters. I have besides been a little bit surprised to read in that paragraph about partnerships that there is no mention whatsoever about United Nations associations. I have been for 13 years a president of a United Nations association. And if there is one, let's say, grassroots movement all around the world, which is really worth uh, cultivating uh, for the United Nations, I think it's the grassroots movements of the United Nations uh, associations. So I think indeed there is work to be done both with regard to the European Union. We have to do a little bit of soul searching how fundamental our interest is and commitment is, especially when it is about making more room for the EU as such, uh, rather than the individual member states at all these United Nations meetings. There are already too many Europeans in the room. We have to think seriously about uh, a little bit uh, consolidating our positions, but that requires giving up also some privileged places, seats, speaking time, and so on within the United Nations. And I think the UN seriously has to reflect upon its very nature. The intergovernmental nature of the UN, I think, is problematic in a world of global governance with so many other players and stakeholders. And uh, to be very honest, I mean, if the Charter starts with the beautiful preamble of we the peoples, I think that's a very promising thing to do. But you all know that once you have the real text of the United Nations Charter, it's not anymore about we the peoples, it's about we the governments. And I think that should be somewhat uh, reflected upon. And I hope the UN will have indeed that stamina to uh, change itself and become a wider organization. How to do that? It's very difficult. I don't have recipes for that immediately, but we have to engage into uh, that discussion because it's really, I think, fundamental for the way forward of the international uh, community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Waters, for, for sketching how much 
it will be uh, difficult. I mean, the future of the Security Council will be uh, complicated in the face of great power competition, but also how it will be difficult for the EU to facilitate uh, the reform. Uh, time is flying, so we are coming to soon to the end of this event. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Yonel Samfier, who has not only orchestrated this event, uh, but has also been the author of an in-depth analysis that was published today, and I make a bit of publicity. It's uh, on our website. It's also, you can also uh, find it on the EPRS app. And I'd like you, uh, Yonel, reacting to what was said before, but also uh, introducing uh, the findings of your uh, in-depth analysis to say a few words that would be also uh, some words of, of conclusions for that event. Uh, please, Yonel. Thank you very much, Etienne. Indeed, we have just published an analysis that uh, tries to give a very comprehensive uh, picture of the complexity of EU legal statutes in the entire UN system and of the complex partnerships it has established with different parts of the UN system. Now, coming at the end after such a distinguished panel, it's not easy to say something relevant, of course, but I'll try to share with you some of the insights that I've reached during uh, this research. Of course, not everything is perfect in what the EU does at the EU level, but I think it's legitimate to say that the EU is a very active, is a credible and coherent actor in the United Nations today. It's been uh, very present with a lot of resolutions, statements and other actions. It has tried to coordinate with uh, EU member states uh, whenever possible, even if sometimes there are clear obstacles. For example, it was a case with the global compact on migration. And uh, it very often tries to build uh, broader coalitions with uh, third countries, which are like-minded on issues such as uh, human rights, for example, or freedom of religion or on death uh, penalty. Moreover, the EU is legally speaking a very important component of what we call today rules-based multilateralism. I want to remind you here that the European Union is itself a party to numerous UN treaties it's party to 49 original multilateral UN treaties and to numerous other subsequent agreements. One of these is the Paris Agreements, with the European Union being the only non-state party to it. And the Union was also a very important driver behind the drafting of this agreement. And I would like to also mention another example of a treaty that is currently being negotiated in the United Nations framework. It's the so-called Binding Treaty on Business and Human Rights, it's an endeavor that the European Parliament strongly supports. And there we can clearly see how the European Union exercises its role. It didn't have a formal mandate from the Council, but just by using its diplomatic capacity and coordinating in an ad hoc way with the EU member states, the EU has been able to have a very important impact on the drafting process of this treaty, which I must say is not yet finalized. So we we'll have to see how things will go on. Of course, when you talk about the EU's relationship with the United System, it's impossible not to mention EU's financial capacity. The European Union is an important provider of funding together with the uh, member states. It provides something between one third, one quarter. Apparently, it has decreased, so it was one third a couple of years ago of the total budget of the UN systems. Of course, all this is channeled, or most of it is channeled through the UN uh, system. And in the end, it, 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 it's beneficial for third countries in uh, the field of development in humanitarian matters. But I want to say that the EU also benefits a lot from these long-term partnerships it has established with various US agencies, funds, programs. And if you want to see a few examples, I invite you to have a look at our analysis. But as every other speaker before me has stressed, the multilateral system faces numerous challenges, and the European Union is aware of it. I think in numerous uh, documents, uh, conclusions of the Council Resolution of the Parliament, this has been clear. Uh, the European Union supports uh, comprehensive reform of the UN system to make it fit, to make it more effective. And uh, we, we cannot ignore these, uh, these important challenges. And to give just two, two examples in the, in the short time that, uh, that's left, uh, of course, uh, we are all shocked when the United States uh, decided to withdraw from the WHO, the World Health Agency. But it's not a move without precedent in the recent history of the United Nations. Very interestingly, between 2012 and 2016, seven new member states decided to withdraw from another UN agency. 
the so-called UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization. It's, it's an organization that has a fully similar status to the WHO. And today, this organization is headed by a Chinese official. I don't want to say that this is something negative. Of course, China's rise can be a very positive thing, but it's important that any change will not undermine in any way the principles that were enshrined in the UN Charter. And among these, there are the human rights. And I think here we have big challenges. And United, the European Union, of course, is a, is a very strong supporter of human rights, and it's been very active in human in United Nations forums on various issues of human rights. But as a speaker said before me, the United Nations is what member states are. And if we look at the situation in the real world, signs are not encouraging. Actually, democracy has been declining. The number of democracies has been declining. It's possible that today authoritarian regimes uh, outnumber democracies in the world. And this has a profound impact on an organization such as the United Nations, which is based on the principle of one country, one vote. Of course, with the COVID that the United uh, Nations Security Council, uh, things are a little bit different. Moreover, uh, we see a very targeted uh, action by authoritarian regimes to, to undermine uh, human rights at UN level. And we've heard uh, that th this campaign, uh, the 75th anniversary has uh, targeted young people, the civil society organization. But on the other hand, there have been many cases when civil society organizations were prevented or were harassed when they tried to come to the UN to speak in human rights forums, such as in the UN Human Rights Council. This goes against this policy of including more the civil society. And there were other actions, such as when we see authoritarian countries using the human rights language to justify their violations of human rights, when we see how they protect each other, for example, in the UN Security Council, so it has taken so long to, to support a global ceasefire. And I say all this because recently in the, the State of the Union speech, the President of the European Commission has made clear that the European Union should be more assertive on human rights uh, through passing to, to qualify majority. And I think this is not only good for the European Union for its values, but it could be also an enhancement of multilateralism and uh, the United Nations systems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yonel. Uh, Mrs. Rodriguez Ramos, as the first speaker, you are the only one that couldn't react to any of the uh, previous speakers. Would you like to say something as a reaction or as a conclusion? Uh, <laughs> excuse me, I'm mute? No, I am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, um, I have seen uh, a long list of challenges ahead uh, in reforming and uh, reviewing the structures of the United Nations system. Um, the uh, Agenda 2030 and the uh, uh, Agenda of Peace and Security, um, um, Arms Control and Disarmament, uh, we have a long, a long list. Uh, but um, there are uh, uh, it's, it's, it is the moment, no? Uh, the United Nations and uh, European Union uh, together uh, lead this reform because it's, it's, uh, it's very, very, very important. All challenges, all needs of uh, uh, citizens. Uh, uh, this poses uh, a challenge. Uh, if states and multilateral institutions are not able to adapt uh, uh, to the well and the needs of today's citizens, they will lose their legitimacy and effectiveness in an extremely dynamic, dynamic uh, uh, world, world. But uh, we uh, haven't an second plan there 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 isn't an, uh, another plan uh, there is an option 
without uh, multilateralism and nationalism and populism, uh, there is an option because it's peace or war, is development, uh, social development, economy, uh, sustainable uh, development, or um, uh, um, an system of collapse of economy collapse. Of. It's not possible uh, to to choose. We need uh, uh, to uh, work together. Um, European Union uh, uh, has a strong commitment to uh, lead this important reform in this exceptional and important time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, that will be the conclusion of our event. I would like to express my thank to all the speakers that took the time and stay with us for this uh, this uh, conversation. Uh, an online event is always a challenge, but you could, uh, at least the one that was speaking after, afterwards, could react to the previous uh, presentations. We managed also to embed a few questions from the audience uh, with the blog. So I think it's uh, it's good. Uh, I would like also to thank uh, anne Cecil, Lionel, and Tanya for the their contribution to the preparation. Uh, just to announce that we next week are going to have two EPRS events. On Tuesday, the 29th of September, the former US ambassador to the EU, Anthony Garner, will present his book in a conversation with our Secretary General Klaus Welle. Uh, um, and I think this is uh, very much linked to uh, the discussions that we had today about a commitment to multilateralism and engagement also of the US uh, within the UN. On the day after, the Wednesday 30th of September, there will be another event dedicated to a complete different subject, that is the circular economy as part of the Green Deal. Both events are online and details can be found on the EPRS website in case you are not on our mailing list. So many thanks to all of you uh, and I wish you a good day and a good working day, a good long working day for Alex. Uh, we are uh, in the middle of the afternoon in Brussels. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure.